Richard Speck, Part 1. Saturday, December 6, 1941. President Roosevelt sent a message to Emperor Hirohito. I am confident that both of us have a sacred duty to restore traditional amity and prevent further death and destruction in the world. That same Saturday, Richard Benjamin Speck was born in Kirkwood, Illinois. As his parents hoped for a wonderful life for their seventh child, the Japanese were on their way to bombing Pearl Harbor on that seventh day of December. Those two events set in motion vastly different circumstances, yet they were inextricably linked by one thing, death. Richard's parents were religious and abstinence from alcohol was strictly observed within their home. His aptly named father, Benjamin Franklin Speck, was by all accounts a loving father with a strong work ethic. Richard's mother, Mary Margaret, had been raised by a foster family after her own mother died in childbirth. Her foster family had founded a United Presbyterian Church, and she was raised with strict, pious values. It was extremely important to her that her own home be equally devout. Richard had six older siblings and one younger, with a nine-year age gap between him and his next older sister. From the book Crime of the Century, the Speck family was poor and raising eight children in those tough times tested the family's mettle. Benjamin Speck was an honest, hardworking man who earned money as a farmer, logger, and packer for Western stoneware. Richard's preschool youth was happy until his father died from a heart attack just after Christmas. Richard was only six at the time and exceptionally close to his father. This trauma led to regressive behaviors, such as eating crayons. Three years later, his mother remarried to an abusive alcoholic with an extensive criminal record. The next oldest sibling at the time was about 18 years old, and the oldest was 29. So Richard and his younger sister were essentially the only children in the home. Crime of the century. He was the one son who never really had a father figure. He would later learn to violently hate his stepfather, an alcoholic lunatic who frequently abused him. The four of them moved from Illinois to Dallas, Texas, where Richard's youth was doused with beatings, verbal abuse, and frequent moves to various poor neighborhoods. When Richard was 10, his 23-year-old brother died in a car accident. Crime of the century. His eighth grade teacher described him in this way. He was sort of sulky, but he didn't talk back. He was a loner. He didn't have any friends in class. He seemed sort of lost. He didn't seem to know what was going on. I don't think I ever saw him smile. I wasn't able to teach him anything. He seemed to be in a fog. Richard's persona was like many abused children, distant, anxious, engaging in risky and criminal behavior poor grades, and substance abuse. Richard started drinking at 12 years old. He was first arrested at 13 for riding through a used car lot, setting rags on fire when the owner chased him and other kids away. He was getting drunk daily by 15 years old. Scopophobia, the fear of being stared at, prevented Richard from speaking aloud in school or developing any ongoing social relationships. Richard simply couldn't relate to others in appropriate ways. He dropped out of school after failing every class just before he turned 16, which I'm sure was a surprise to no one. Between the ages of 13 and 24, Richard was arrested 41 times. Sometime during his teen years, he got a tattoo which said, born to raise hell, a nod to his birth having been mere hours before the attack on Pearl Harbor. When Speck is drinking, he will fight or threaten anybody as long as he has a knife or gun. 
When he's sober or unarmed, he couldn't face down a mouse. Richard had managed to become just like the stepfather he loathed, a criminal who violently mistreated him, who introduced him to alcoholism, who taught him to exploit the weakness in others. This awful man had taken the place of his father and, worst of all, he was welcomed in by Richard's own mother. Her duplicitous morality, insisting on a righteous, alcohol-free home, then allowing an abusive drunk to run the home, caused Richard to both love and hate women. For Richard, women brought life and nurturing, but also lies, destruction, and pain. 1961. Richard had been treated for STDs five times by 19 years old when he met 15-year-old Shirley at the Texas State Fair. She was pregnant only a few weeks later, and they married the following January. If not for physical abuse, frequent and blatant affairs, getting drunk as often as possible, and being in and out of jail, Richard was an ideal husband, or something. One thing going for him was that he was always known to be fastidiously clean. He hated being dirty or appearing unkempt, and it would be normal for him to change his shirt several times a day. 1962. Baby Robbie Lynn was born July 5, 1962, while her daddy was in jail, serving time for disturbing the peace, also known as fighting while drunk. Richard lovingly thanked his wife and welcomed their baby girl to the world by refusing to pay any of their hospital bills. The offer was made for him to pay part of the bill by donating blood, but he refused to even do that. He was quite a prize. When he was around, Richard treated Shirley with as much love and affection as a cat shows a wounded bird. One of his favorite ways to torment his young wife was to pick up women and make out with them in front of their home so Shirley and anyone else in the neighborhood could see. This was hilarious to no one but him. 1963. 21-year-old Richard was arrested for forgery of a co-worker's paycheck and for burglarizing a grocery store for basic, life-sustaining necessities. Beer and cigarettes, obviously. He was given a three-year prison sentence, but he didn't even serve half of that. Richard spent a whole seven days as a free man until he attacked a woman with a knife and was quickly apprehended. He was given a 16-month sentence this time, but luck was on his side. A paperwork error released him after serving only six months for both the parole violation and the additional crime of aggravated assault. 1965, July. Richard worked as a truck driver for three months, which may have been his longest running employment. He was ultimately fired though, because he couldn't be bothered to show up anymore. He'd been in six trucking accidents during those three months. Richard had been fired by the world's most forgiving employer. December. Richard's mom convinced him to move in with a single mom to babysit her three kids. Completely normal, if you don't really think about it at all. 1966. January. Shirley, Richard's long-abandoned wife, filed for divorce. Later in the month... Richard stabbed a guy at the bar where his lady roommate worked. He was charged with disturbing the peace with the hefty consequence of serving three days in jail and paying a fine of $10. That would be about $85 today. March 5th. Richard burglarized a store for 70 cartons of cigarettes. He used his refined criminal prowess to sell them out of the trunk of his car from the parking lot of the store where they'd just been stolen. He abandoned that car and was issued a warrant for his arrest. So he fled from Dallas back to his hometown Chicago to be closer to his older siblings. 
He couch surfed for a while and spent most of his time bar hopping. He did manage to do some carpentry work through the help of one of his brothers, building a few hog houses and other small projects. Somehow, Richard found out that his now ex-wife had remarried only two days after their divorce was finalized. Though clearly an appalling husband and an absent father, he was furious that his ex-wife moved on so quickly. But Richard also chose to move on quickly, in two random boarding houses, staying perpetually drunk, getting detained overnight for assaulting a guy with a knife in a tavern bathroom, things like that. Sunday, April 3rd. 65-year-old Mrs. Harris found Richard in her home when she returned from babysitting at 1 a.m. He, of course, had a knife. He blindfolded her, tied her up, invaded the poor woman's body in the vilest of ways, and stole miscellaneous items, including the $2.50 she'd just earned. Wednesday, April 9th, 32-year-old Mary Kay was working at a tavern owned by her brother-in-law when she was reported missing. Her body was found several days later, behind the tavern, inside an empty hog house that Richard had helped build. Friday, April 15th. When Richard arrived at the tavern to pick up his paycheck, he was questioned by investigators regarding any knowledge he may have had about Mary Kay's murder. He was asked to meet them a few days later to be further questioned. Naturally, he booked it to mooch off his sister Martha, but ever the masterful criminal, Richard left behind items he'd stolen from Mrs. Harris's house, as well as things from other local burglaries. He'd brazenly connected himself to specific crimes, but he was gone. Tuesday, April 19th. Richard's brother-in-law, Gene, had a stable career with the United States Navy, so he encouraged and helped Richard to apply to be an apprentice seaman at the National Maritime Union, the NMU. He found work aboard a leg freighter at the end of the month. Tuesday, May 3rd. After only three days on the freighter, Richard was evacuated due to appendicitis and underwent an emergency appendectomy. He enjoyed that hospital stay by flirting with one of the nurses, then returned to Martha's apartment to be babysat- I mean, recover. Before marrying Jean, Martha had been a registered nurse. She was 14 years older than Richard, had a family, and pitied her brother for the difficulties he'd been through in his life, especially with losing their father. I have a hunch that Martha knew of some of his minor brushes with the law and that she wanted to be a positive influence for him, but I can't imagine that she would have allowed Richard to remain with her children if she knew who he really was. Martha and Jean were generous in their caretaking while also nudging Richard to get a job and generally grow up. He was 24 divorced with a child he never saw and certainly didn't know or financially support. He was homeless and he was aimless. Friday, May 20th. Richard returned to his work on the freighter. This time he made it 25 days. Tuesday, June 14th. Richard was kicked off of the freighter for excessive drinking and fighting an officer while drunk. After losing that job, he did the responsible thing and traveled to Michigan to meet the nurse he'd met while in the hospital after his appendectomy. He then conveniently found himself freeloading at Martha's home again. Thursday, June 30th. Jean drove Richard to the NMU to file for his Siemens card. I can only deduce that a previous eviction from a freighter for brawling an officer was not a deal breaker for obtaining additional work. Across the street, 150 feet away from the NMU, were townhouses used by the nearby South Chicago Community Hospital to serve as overflow dormitories for student nurses. Saturday, July 2nd. 19-year-old Renee, 19-year-old Patricia, and 21-year-old Anne disappeared in Indiana near the shore of Lake Michigan. A further four murders took place in Michigan. 
with victims ranging in age from only 7 up to 60 years old. Richard's brief time through the Great Lakes meant that he'd been very close to all of these murders, maybe more. However, police were never able to question him, and these tragedies have gone unsolved with only long-term speculation that Richard may have been involved. I mention these not to muddy the waters of this story, but because Richard clearly had no difficulty pursuing his violent side, and it's quite likely, perhaps even absolute, that he was involved in many more crimes than those for which he was arrested. Friday, July 8th. Jean drove Richard back to the NMU to pick up his Siemens card and register for a new job opening. After living with them for several weeks, Martha and Jean must have been eager to get Richard back on task, get a job, and get out of their home. Unfortunately, someone with seniority got the job first, so Richard returned home with Jean. Again. Without the benefit of a warning text that we may send today, I picture the fed-up look on Martha's face as Jean walked in the door with Richard. Oh good, you're home! You're just in time for dinner. Gosh, I was just thinking, I'm so glad we're free of Oh, oh hi Richard! How'd it, how'd it go? I was just telling Jean how glad I am that uh, we're just, uh, we're free of the ridiculous ants that we've been getting with all the heat this summer. Monday, July 11th. Three more days together, and Richard had officially overstayed his welcome. Martha and family were done housing and babysitting him. Jean drove him, again, to the NMU hiring hall, and Richard spent the night at a rooming house. Tuesday, July 12th. After receiving good news about an assignment on an oil tanker about 30 minutes away, Richard got a ride to the job. Upon arrival, he was told that the job had already been filled. In fact, the job had intentionally been double booked just in case the other guy didn't show up. Richard was furious. He returned to the NMU only to find out that the hiring hall was closed for the day. While having a mental tantrum, he overheard some commotion across the street. He walked toward the back entrance of the townhouse dormitories, where he saw a group of nurses talking, laughing, and being the cute young women that they were. Richard continued walking and asked the manager of a service station if he could leave his bags there for a while. He was refused. That manager saw a tattoo on Richard's arm. Born to raise hell, huh? You bet. I've raised plenty in my time, too. Richard continued in search of a place to keep his bags. He came upon a Shell gas station and was able to leave them there, stating he'd be back soon. He called Jean, asking for help from him for the next day. Surely Jean's clout would help him get a seaman's job faster. But that night, Richard didn't have money for a room. It's unknown where he slept perhaps on a park bench in Luella Park, directly behind the nurses' dormitories. Or maybe he rested against the wall of the NMU building. He may not have slept at all, as he stewed with anger about the job he could have had that day. Wednesday, July 13th. Richard retrieved his bags from the Shell station and went to the NMU hiring hall again. He was still heated about the previous day's misadventure. Martha and Jean drove to visit him, parking at Luella Park. I imagine a generous amount of whining from Richard. Martha likely felt a twinge of motherly empathy for her little bro who couldn't seem to figure out how to adult. But that was now overridden by sheer annoyance. The annoyance only a sibling can ignite. She gave him some money like a kind, generous, albeit somewhat enabling sister. It's far easier to quell the feeling of guilt when you give something as you walk away. Richard used that money to check in to the shipyard inn about a mile away. Thereafter, the homeless and jobless 24-year-old spent a great deal of focused, quality time soul-searching and looking for meaningful employment. Just kidding, he spent the day drinking. 
53-year-old Ella May was also drinking that day. They imbibed in the same places as Richard stalked her until he coerced her via the conspicuous knife he was holding to take him to her room. There, he asked her grossed questions like, have you ever been with the younger man? And do you want to? Yuck. He then forcibly violated her and stole her gun. Afterward, Richard got dinner and resumed his heavy drinking. Some accounts suggest he also consumed barbiturates and amphetamines. That night, the criminal with 41 counts of arrest, who always sort of slid under the radar, made sure that he would never be overlooked again. After all, he was born to raise hell. Dressed in black, carrying his knife and Ella May's gun, Richard began walking toward unsuspecting student nurses.